Good morning. I'm Tamara Shoemaker. Um, this morning I was reading the scriptures and the Lord gave me a message about ruining your dinner. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the first thing that I would do every day when I would get home from school as a kid, um, I would drop my book bag by the table and I would head to the pantry and I would grab a snack. If uh, my mom had little Debbie snacks, those are preferable, of course. Oatmeal cream pies are my favorite. But more often than not, I had to settle for crackers or for a piece of bread, uh, whatever we had on hand. So I'd sit down at the table and um, I would munch away while I flipped open my notebook and um, as I began my homework. So then sometimes I would head back to the pantry for snack number two. But here's the thing about mothers. God gives them a miraculous hearing almost about the same time as he gives them eyes in the back of their head um, and it snaps their focus into place as soon as they hear the refrigerator door open or the pantry door open. And this miraculous hearing works even on the far side of the house. So my mom would say, Tamara, you're going to spoil your dinner. And I would say, please. She says, no, you've had one snack already. So for whatever reason, in the United States at least, there's this general consensus that um, the typical human should have three solid meals a day, right? Or several snacks throughout the day, but not both and. In other words, you shouldn't have breakfast, snack, 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 lunch, snack, 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 dinner, snack, 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 because that's just a recipe for first heartburn and then second massive weight gain. So on the opposite end, what happens um, when you don't get your food and you enjoy major and sorry, you end up majorly de uh, delaying your eating time or you skip it altogether. You get really hangry, right? Which I found out is an actual word defined by Merriam-Webster dictionary. So I will accept it as a word and I'll, be, I'll use it. So we get really hangry. Um, and that means, you know, just being irritable or angry because of hunger. So it appears that there is a proper time for the body to receive food. The schedule is going to vary for each person according to, to their uh, metabolic needs, but there is a schedule that each body responds to, right? So what's this have to do with scripture? It's a really good question. I actually skipped out of Exodus today. I've been trying to read through Exodus, but today I skipped out because I started in Matthew chapter 24 and I never got out of it. So Matthew 24 begins with the prophetic discourse from Jesus, where he begins to talk about some of the things that are going to happen long before they ever happen. And some of what he prophesied has been fulfilled, which, uh, for instance, the sacking of Jerusalem and the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Romans. Other parts of what he said haven't taken place yet. Um, they refer specifically to the last days when Jesus comes again. So here's something interesting that totally twisted my brain this morning, um, sparked by Matthew 24, 38 to 41. It says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the son of man. Two men will be in a field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill one will be taken and the other left. So in the mid-90s, when I was in high school, one of the popular songs that we sang in our school's chapel services was a song called I Wish We'd All Been Ready, written by Larry Norman, I believe released in 1970. Um, and that song depicted us almost a grim take on the rapture idea, um, focusing on those who were left behind. The lyrics are, <clears throat> excuse me, the lyrics in the song are clearly based on the passage in Matthew 24. Um, two men walking up a hill, one disappears and one's left standing still. It's one of the lines I remember. I wish we'd all been ready. So the ringing theme throughout the song is too late. It's too late. So now I do believe, according to scripture, that there will be a day that comes when it will be too late. So Matthew 25, 10, for instance, says the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. But the clear picture in my mind from Larry Norman's song was the one who is taken is the one who's caught up to be with Christ, and the one who's left is the one for whom it's too late, right? But this was my brain twist this morning, because I went back to the scripture part where it says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen 
until the flood came and took them all away. So in this scenario, who gets taken away? It's the people outside the ark, the people not saved from the waters, the people who chose to ridicule Noah instead of join him. So this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, says the scripture. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other one left. So what if it's not as I previously thought, that the ones who are left are the ones who are left behind, but instead the ones who are left are the ones who stand there on that field or by that hand mill embracing the Lord Jesus as he returns to earth, bringing his kingdom with him in all his glory. Brain twist. I have never thought of it like that before. What if when Jesus says, this then is how you should pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He meant that he is bringing his kingdom here, now, today, yesterday, tomorrow, and always. What if when Jesus says, give us today our daily bread, he didn't mean one day at the wedding feast of the Lamb, when the old heaven and the old earth have passed away, but he meant right now. What if he meant us to live as though heaven were here right now, and that when he returns, he makes us new? What if he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new, and that is actually a Bible verse found in Revelation 21, 5. Okay, but 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with the ones who have already died in Christ, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And I think that is the main verse that the, the whole rapture idea is based on. But what if that meeting place in the clouds was like the return of the prodigal son to his father, a parable Jesus told in Luke 15, 11 to 32. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him, and then he took his son back to the house where they killed the fatted calf and had a big celebration. Luke 15, 20. So what if in the excitement and joy and exuberance of this final, flawless, triumphant, joyous reunion, the Lord can't wait to put his arms around his people, to meet with us in fellowship, and he catches us up into the clouds as he brings his kingdom with him. I don't know if this is sound doctrine. Honestly, I don't. I think there's too much guesswork um, to be able to know for sure what's going to happen on that final day. And I think also that a lot of what we think and believe based on our interpretation of scripture will turn out to be maybe a little bit different from what we imagine on that final day when it finally comes. But the point is, it's coming. So in the message at our outdoor service last week, our pastor said something that's kind of stuck with me. He said something to the effect of, I don't know that God is going to vacuum us all up like some heavenly vacuum cleaner. <laughs> um, there seems to be enough evidence in scripture that he is coming to set up his heavenly kingdom in a new earth. So I'm going to leave that thought with you for a second to consider, to read about in scripture, and to pray that the Holy Spirit guides you in your interpretation, because I'm going to be doing the same thing on this end. Um, I was going somewhere with my snack analogy, and I got, totally got sidetracked by that brain twist. But anyway, back to Matthew 24, 45. It says, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? Too much snacking interrupts a healthy appetite. A wise servant of the master is going to manage the master's household by giving the staff their food at the proper time. So this denotes wisdom, um, discernment, right? Knowing when to speak and when to keep silent. Ecclesiastes 3, um, that first whole section. Why? Because if the household is given too many snacks, then, which may be okay um, for some foods, and some are mostly harmless foods like snack crackers and everything else, then they're going to miss out on their appetite for the core foods like the protein and the vitamin-rich vegetables and the things that your body craves for health, for health's sake. So, if the church is given too many light sermons, their appetite for the protein gets lost. Protein-like. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father but by him. That is not a popular message, right? Because people like their other ways. In all honesty, we sometimes push aside the uncomfortable fact that there is one truth and his name is Jesus. We sometimes ignore the fact that there will be consequences for those who choose to reject the message of the cross because it's uncomfortable to remember that those who choose another path besides Jesus are separated from him forever. Because guys, there is no heaven A for those who believe one way and heaven B for those who believe another. There is one truth, one new heaven, one new earth. And there is a one-time separation between those on the right and those on the left. And I don't mean politically. We have got to get rid of this dull senses idea of this life is all there is. It's not. I mean, not even a little bit. Live your life today like the one that comes after you leave it is the one that counts the most. That was a word that God gave me this morning, and I don't know that I chose all the most comfortable words to put it in, but the Holy Spirit, I have found, isn't too interested in comfort. He's not interested in my comfort. He's not interested in most people's comfort. He is interested in doing some changing of the heart, and sometimes you have to get a little bit uncomfortable to make those changes happen. So that's what I felt led to say today. I hope that the message that you heard there sinks, sinks in. Let it, let the Holy Spirit do his work in your life, in your heart. You know, pray that he will work in you because he will. He will meet us where we're at and he'll lead us along the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Have a good Sunday, y'all. I'm going to church. I'm excited for this outdoor service that we're getting ready to have. I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will meet us there. I hope you all have a wonderful Sunday and fellowship with believers wherever you're at. All right. Talk to you later.